pretty firm on the schedule, but where there is flexibility, we can move things around as well. All right. Okay, well, it's good to be here and uh, joy to be back at Morningstar after the COVID interlude. So it's really a joy to see everybody once again. And I'd like you to turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians 6. And I'm going to just read verses 9 through 11. And I'm going to just uh, mention about where we're heading in these studies, at least the ones that I'm going to be dealing with. Uh, one of the things that I am concerned about is the lack of teaching, maybe, in many of our assemblies, on the issue of sanctification, living a holy life, a Christ-like life. And many of our problems in our assemblies really come down to the flesh. Well, not just our problems in our assemblies. <laughs> many of our problems in our personal lives come down to the flesh. So we want to look at the flesh, its devastating effects in our personal lives, in our marriages, in our assemblies, and just in general, there's the ravaging effects. And then God's solution, he has solutions to these things. And so we want to think about that. But tonight I want to just begin by thinking about the sanctifying effect of the gospel. That when you get saved, something happens to you. Then we're going to talk about what happens after you're saved, but actually when you are saved, there's something tremendous takes place. So I'd like to go to chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians. I want to read verses 9 through 11. I'm going to kind of lay a background foundation for where we're going the rest of our studies here. But it begins in verse 9 like this. It says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God, and such were some of you. But, that's a delightful word right there in that text, but you are washed, but ye are sanctified. But ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And again, God will bless that short reading uh, of the Word of God to us. Now, I'm going to kind of lay out an outline of where Excuse we're going to go. Me, Mike, what translation did you use? Uh, the, the, it was not the artificial intelligence version. <laughs> okay. no, I'm just Authorized version. <laughs> Authorized to be read in churches and Morningstar Bible Camp. So it's okay. <laughs> so I want to give you a kind of a brief outline. I want, to, I want to look a little bit about Corinth because I think it's important for us to kind of pay a little visit to Corinth. We'll look at the place and then we'll, we'll look at how bad it was and yet there's a promise that God gave to Paul about this place. We'll think about the promise. And then we'll think about the preacher. We'll think about the man that brought the gospel to this place. And then we want to think about the power the power of the gospel, the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of believing prayer that, that changed this bleak scene uh, into something very beautiful. And then we want to look at the people. We want to look at the, the, the converts in Corinth. And we're going to look at the religious sinners and the rotten sinners. All sinners, but they're, uh, we're going to look at them. And then we're going to look at not only their past condition, but their present position. So that's kind of where we're headed. But I want to begin with, by thinking a little bit about the city of Corinth. Um, at the time of Paul's visit, somewhere around about AD 51, depending on who you read, uh, the, the, the city was, um, was a, a quite a, a bustling metropolis. Uh, certainly over 100,000 people, some say even up to 600,000, depending on estimates which you read. It was the chief city of the province of Asia. And in that city, um, there was a temple uh, to Aphrodite, the goddess Aphrodite. And um, there were over 1,000 temple prostitutes. She was a goddess of love. And this temple was built on top of the Acro Corinth. And the temple prostitutes, of course, would, would descend down the hill and ply their trade at night. 
Uh, in the city itself, there was over 33 wine shops have been excavated uh, in, in Corinth. So it was a place that liquor was flowing freely, uh, sexual activity was rampant, and it was a place that was popular with sailors, partly because um, the difficulty with sailing around the bottom of Greece, what we call the Peloponnese coast, is that it was notorious for storms and shipwrecks. And so what people would do is, Corinth was kind of like a, uh, it was a, what's what we call an isthmus, it was, a, it was like a neck, okay, a narrow neck, and, and I can give you the, the details of it, uh, I can't give it in kilometers because I don't speak <laughs> Canadian, so you're going to have to translate it into kilometers from miles, but it's 20 miles long and somewhere between 4 to 8 miles wide, uh, 4 at the narrowest, 8 at the widest. And so, so this, this, this neck, and so what they would do is rather than sail around the bottom, they would, they would pull into one side of Corinth, and they had tracks going across. Now eventually they built the Corinth Canal, which eliminated the need of these tracks. But what they would do is they would unload their wares onto trucks or water, or, you know, kind of horse-drawn things, take them across to the other side of Corinth, and then load them again onto ships there. So you've got two ports, one coming in, one going out. And you imagine all these sailors and what they're doing while they're waiting for the, lay, the load to be laden on the other ship. Well, they've got a lot of activity. 33 wine shops we know of, a lot of prostitution, all the rest of it. So it was really quite a, an immoral city. Uh, in fact, uh, in the ancient world, just as the word Sodom... Uh, you know, the city of Sodom became associated with a lifestyle, the sin of sodomy. Well, Corinth became associated in, the, in that world with immoral living. Uh, you, were, you were a Corinthian or to Corinthianize. And it even uh, kind of carried on, uh, even in Britain, uh, during the days, you know, when in 1776, you know, when America kind of rebelled against the empire and all that terrible stuff that went on then. Uh, part of it was George was out of his mind and his son, the Prince Regent, was running the country and he, well, he and his pals used to Corinthianize. That's what they called them. They were, they were, they were just kind of cabs. They were, they were always into trouble. So, so basically the word Cor Corinth has certainly carried with it a message. As well as all of that, it was famous for sport. It, has, it was the home of the Isthmian Games. And of course, these games, actually, it was, it was even more popular than Athens and the Olympic Games. So basically, what you're talking about is a city that is sport mad, sex mad, and very materialistic. Does that sound like any place near you? <laughs> Can you see the relevance, right? And, and, and so it, it really is. And, and the other thing about the city, with divorce was rampant. It was a litigation society. Uh, it has all the hallmarks of what we know to be society that we are familiar <coughs> with today. That's what <coughs> Corinth was like. John Phillips describes it this way, he says, In the Greek or Roman world of Paul's day, casual and promiscuous sex was as common as it is today. People thought nothing of it. At Corinth in particular, immorality was so widely practiced that like Sodom in the Old Testament, the name of the city became a synonym for vice. To Corinthianize was to practice debauchery. And so that is the Corinth that we're thinking of. And yet, when we look at the book of Acts, so I want you just to just go back to Acts chapter 18. As Paul goes into this city, he gets a promise from the Lord. And it's an interesting thing. Verse 9, Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. Isn't that encouraging? He's in this city that is just rampant with immorality, and yet the Lord tells him, you, you preach, don't hold back, you, give, you preach the message, because 
uh, I have many people in this city. Of course, the Lord knows who's going to be saved before they're saved, doesn't he? I mean, nothing comes by surprise to him. He's, he's omniscient. And, and he knew that there were people who were going to respond to the gospel message in that city. And so, uh, by the way, Paul needed that encouragement. Uh, I really believe he did at this point. Because if you think about his journey to Corinth, um, he, he'd been... Um, beaten and imprisoned uh, in Philippi. He'd been gone from there to Thessalonica, saw some blessing, but had been run out of time there. Had gone to Athens and had dealt with the philosophers there. And that was very discouraging because they listened, but they didn't respond very well. And then now he's in Corinth. So it's kind of been a rough journey. And no doubt he's discouraged and maybe even a bit gun shy. You know, if you've been beaten and imprisoned, <laughs> and you've been run out of town, you might be tempted to think, oh, I don't want to speak. <laughs> you know, it's not like uh, getting a warm welcome when you come to Morningstar. It's got a very different environment in those days. And, and so no doubt he was feeling somewhat discouraged and he needed encouragement. I want to think about Paul the preacher just for a minute. Again, just from his own words. Look at 1 Corinthians again, chapter 2. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1. And, and again, we, we think of Paul, and I think one of the disservices we do to the Apostle Paul is that we somehow make him out to be some kind of almost like you know the Marvel comics have these superheroes you know they kind of you know they wear their everyday clothes and all of a sudden they take them off and underneath it's Superman or Spider-Man or whatever and, and so we've got him almost elevated into super Christian you know this is the guy that is no matter what the problem is he can fight it he can deal with it but I don't think that's what he is trying to convey in his writing. I think part of it is that his words are powerful and weighty. So we tend to think, well, maybe he was this kind of a guy. But if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, Paul writes to them and he says, I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. So he came not with excellency of speech. We tend to think... He was an excellent speaker, right? I mean, dynamic. Uh, but he says, I didn't come with excellency of speech. He, he says, um, or of wisdom. And sometimes we get the idea where he, that he was, he was just so smart, you know? I mean, he was like super intelligent and really wise. And, but he says, no, I didn't come with wisdom either. Declaring to you the testimony of God. So how do we account for the success of Paul's ministry. He tells us plainly he did not depend on overpowering oratory or great philosophical argument. So, so how do we say what, what was the reason for his success? Look at verse 2. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 2. He says, For I determined not to know anything among you Save Jesus Christ and Him crucified, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Now again, what a, what a description, again, doesn't fit the super Christian, kind of dynamic Christian hero idea, right? I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. Like, guy seems like he was a bit nervous. Trembling, right? And, and so, what does he tell us? What's the, what's the answer? How, how was he so successful? How did God use him so much? And he wants us to know that really there's, there's three things really about it. First of all, the power of the gospel itself. And notice, he, again, he just says, I determined to not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Power of the gospel. I want to talk about the dependence upon the Spirit of God and the power of believing prayer. These three things were the secret of Paul's success. The power of the message itself, dependence on the Spirit of God, and the power of believing prayer. Those three things. We're going to look at them. So, certainly, he didn't, he wasn't a man pleaser. He didn't tell the audiences what they wanted to hear, but what they needed to hear. So, if you look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, for instance, 1 Thessalonians 2, again, we'll just, we'll just see this. 1 Thessalonians 2, he tells us in verse 5, just kind of an interesting statement. 
when he was with the believers in Thessalonica, again, where he saw blessing in the gospel. He, he says, <clears throat> that's Colossians, and that's why it's not looking right. First Thessalonians 2, verse 5. He says, for neither at any time used we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. And so he says, he calls upon the readers to verify there was a, a complete absence of any word of flattery in his ministry. He, he didn't tell them nice things that they wanted to hear to gain their approval or to, to influence them in any way. And, and so that there's none of that in his ministry. Uh, so again, how do we get this impression? I, th I said before that I think part of it was his writing that gave the impression that this guy is some kind of powerful individual. If you look at 2 Corinthians 10 verse 10, you read these words, he says, his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is contemptible. So again, this is not fitting our profile, maybe that we've made up in our minds of the Apostle Paul, right? Bodily presence is weak. <laughs> He's not using enticing words, he's not using great wisdom, like he's not exactly Mr. Super Christian in any way as far as these things are concerned. But his letters were very powerful as we know that, they've had an influence on our lives and we're going to be looking at some of his letters as we go through this week. But let's just think about the power of the gospel itself. And notice that he emphasizes back in chapter 2, verse 2, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so it begin, really what he wants us to see is this, that actually it's the message itself that has power. And I wonder, do we really believe that anymore? I wonder if we really believe that the gospel itself is powerful. I mean, scripture states it plainly, but again, if we're really honest, how can you explain what's happened in your life? Right? What, what happened to you? Right? We, we should never doubt the power of the gospel. We know what we used to be. We know what God has done. We know what we and how did that happen? It was the gospel. Right? The gospel changed us. It, it, it's that transforming message. How can, how can we explain it any other way? And so it is powerful. And Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. To the Jew first, also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Not ashamed. It's the power of God unto salvation. Again, 1 Corinthians 1.18, just look there, he says, again, just in the same words, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. That dynamic of God, that, that power to overcome obstacles and difficulty, it's the power of the gospel. We just had some special gospel meetings in our assembly just over a weekend, and we were amazed, actually, we got over a hundred visitors came into the meeting over the weekend, strangers to the assembly. And um, but one of the things that really impressed me, it was a guy called Tim McNeil, he was using the tabernacle as a means to preach the gospel. He did a beautiful job and very simple. And there was one of the, the young sisters, she's, I, I think she's maybe 10 or 11 in our assembly, but she's saved and she's been baptized and she loves the Lord. And... She's in the public schools, and one of the things that Tim kept saying is, if God, if God asked you, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you say? So anyway, we just got a text this week. She'd been at school asking all of her school friends. God asked you, why should... So this little girl got the message, right? 11-year-old, she understood it, and now she's out there sharing it in the public school. Isn't that incredible? The gospel is powerful. And her little mind could grasp it and articulate it because of what she heard. And we, we've seen it historically, haven't we? The, the, the impact of the power of the gospel. We, uh, I love to tell historical stories of great events of the gospel, like D.L. Moody going to Cambridge. And again, God's, God's ways are just not our ways. We, we would never have picked D.L. Moody to go to Cambridge University. He's a shoe clerk, right? I mean, he, 
he, that's what he was professionally. He butchered the English language. When he would read the King James Bible, sometimes he'd get to words he couldn't pronounce them, he'd just get right over them. I mean, this was the El Moody. But God used him to preach in such a way that it impacted Cambridge more than any other individual that had ever spoken at Cambridge University. Many of them, including the Cambridge Seven, went to China as missionaries as a result of the impact of that gospel campaign. It was an amazing thing. And so all I'm saying is this, that sometimes I wonder, um, it, is it a, we're talking about sanctification and holiness, but, but I wonder, is there a lack of sanctification and holiness connected to the lack of gospel work amongst us? Is there a connection between the two? I think there is a powerful connection. We don't preach the gospel anymore. We don't, we don't have preachers of the gospel hardly at all. And we don't see much happening because we've forgotten the gospel. Paul never forgot the gospel. That was his, even when he's writing to the church at Rome, which was a, a church, right? They're believers at Rome. He, he says that when he comes to them, he, he's going to preach the gospel to them that are at Rome also. I find that remarkable. No, Paul, don't preach the gospel. We want ministry means. He says, no, I'm going to preach the gospel. Because it's the power. He knows it's the power of God unto salvation. And, and you know, one of the tragedies is that sometimes, and this is not a dig at Morningstar Bible camp, but sometimes our assemblies have handed over our gospel responsibility to camps. And that's where the gospel work is done. And it's not done in the assembly anymore. Now, I'm not, a lot of kids get saved at camp. Praise God for camp work. I'm not knocking that at all. But support in camp does not alleviate the local assembly of its gospel responsibility to reach its neighborhood with the message of Christ and Him crucified. It doesn't. It's not passing the book. God is not going to let us off with that. We have to be responsible. And so we, we need to think about that. And can I just make a suggestion? I know that we talked a little bit about this at Kelowna yesterday, that there was a time when every Sunday night in every assembly, there would be a gospel meeting. Now we don't have a Sunday night meeting, period, in vast majority of the churches <laughs> at all. Not just assemblies. I mean, I don't know how it happened. It happened in my, on my watch in my lifetime. All of a sudden, the Sunday night meeting just disappeared. And it's rare. How many of you have a Sunday night meeting? I'm just kind of curious. All right. Oak Bay. The only assembly here, right, that has a Sunday night meeting. So what that means practically is that in terms of opportunity to teach the saints, we have midweek. Our midweek meeting is all prayer. No ministry. All prayer. Sunday morning, 11 o'clock, 40 minutes. 40 minutes ministry per week, average assembly, that's the input you get to feed the flock. Do you think the cheap are going to be really well nourished on 40 minutes a week? I'm just been, I'm asking these questions. We need to ask these questions, right? These are serious questions. And so, so because we don't have the Sunday, we don't want to, we only have 40 minutes a week, the average assembly to teach. So we, we can't spare one of those for gospel because we only have, that would leave three 40-minute sessions a month, right? We're in a real dilemma here. And so even a suggestion, just a simple suggestion, is that to even begin by, like our assembly, we're, we're just beginning to flex our muscles again and get involved in outreach. After years, first VBS since 1970. 20 kids came out. Praise the Lord for that. It's like something's happening. Uh, we did the, the, the Route 66 Festival. Gave out 1,800 of those uh, things that Jabe has done with the classic cars. Had a tremendous fellowship together doing it. And then we had this gospel weekend. And what the elders said is, but at least for now, we've got to work on at least once a quarter having some kind of gospel outreach. Got to do it. Got to start somewhere. We might not get back to every Sunday night, but at least if once a quarter, have some kind of exercise. How can we have some kind of meeting where the gospel will be publicly proclaimed and we can invite our contacts to hear a clearly presented gospel message? Just want to just, I'm sowing seeds here. Thoughts. We can discuss this afterwards. But I just, Paul's pretty committed to the gospel, isn't he? 
And, and so, and that's where the power is. And he understands that. Uh, he's not ashamed of it. It's the power of God unto salvation. And, and I, can, I can say, honestly, I, I just was part of a, an outreach in Baldwin City, Kansas, and they do two weeks now of gospel meetings, and it's in a campground. Uh, it, and um, I had the privilege of speaking three nights in the gospel. And one of the, one of the wonderful things about gospel preaching is that there was a, there was a, a relatively new converted Catholic couple who were there for the nights that I spoke. Now, they were probably there every night, but the three nights that I spoke, they were literally glowing. I mean, you could just, I mean, I just preached to them because you could see that they were just eating this stuff up. They were just loving it. And then afterwards, as soon as it finished, they were right up to it. Oh, that was so amazing. That was so wonderful. And what I'm saying is that for young converts, nothing confirms them in their faith more than clearly articulated gospel preaching. It does. It just they get thrilled about this stuff. And you know, when they get so thrilled about it, you know what they're gonna do about that? They're gonna share it. Just like that little girl went out and shared it with her schoolmates. They're gonna go out and share it because they're so excited about it. And so <clears throat> this idea of Paul, the reason for his success. He says, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. He's a man with a message. <laughs> and, and he stuck to the message. He didn't get sidetracked from the message. He saw this as essential to everything else. This message must be kept front and center. And let me say this. If it's not front and center in our assemblies, are we really lampstands at all? I'm just wondering if we are. Are we Christian social clubs? Many of us have just become Christian social clubs. We've lost the gospel front and center. And so he says, I determined. There's a determination on his part not to know anything, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And, and then we, we talked about this idea of the dependence on the Holy Spirit. Because again, he's, he's, he just told us he's in weakness and fear and much trembling. So when you're in that state, what, what, what do you do? Well, you cry out to the Lord in prayer and you have to depend on the Spirit because you feel incredibly weak. And, and so, and again, in terms of the Spirit's ministry, so much of the ministry of the Spirit in the New Testament seems to be directly connected with gospel presentation. Acts 1 verse 8, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, uh, Judea, Samaria, to the most parts of the earth. Behold, I send forth the promise of my Father upon you. Tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And he just told them to go, but he says, no, don't go yet, wait. <laughs> go, wait. Why? Wait, till, don't go without the Holy Spirit. Right? No point going outside your front door unless you know that you're endued with power from on high. Then you can go. And we need the Spirit's power in our preaching and especially in preaching the gospel. This idea of endued is like somebody sinking into a garment and, and, and so clothed with the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to be clothed with the power of the Holy Spirit. And so he can say things like this again back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. As he goes into another city, pagan, uh, filled with uh, all kinds of immorality and all the rest of it. But this is, this is how he describes his coming to them. He says, for our gospel came not to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sakes. And then this idea of the power of believing prayer in the gospel preaching. And again, I just say this, that um, when, you're, when you are weak and trembling and fearful, your only recourse is to cry out to God. Lord, unless you come through, it's hopeless, right? We need divine help here. And, and, and again, I want to say this, some of the most vibrant prayer meetings I've ever been in were connected with gospel testimony. 
where you want the Lord, Lord, you got to show up. We don't want to just go through the motions here. We want you to work. We want to see the, 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 the wind blowing where it wills, those sweet breezes of the Holy Spirit blowing through the meeting. We want to see this. And, and many a great uh, gospel campaign has begun with tremendous seasons of prayer. And God has come through and worked in tremendous power. But I want you to notice now that the people, uh, this, um, let's go back to Acts 18, just the, the impact of Paul's ministry in Corinth. Uh, we, we're thinking about him, we're thinking about as he went there. Uh, first of all, notice it says in verse 4, we want to think about what we call these religious sinners. And it's amazing that uh, it seems like one of the most dangerous positions to be in, in Corinth, was to be a ruler in the synagogue. Because it says in chapter 18, verse 4, he reasoned in the synagogues every Sabbath day and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And then look at verse 8. It says, Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. I want you to just imagine that. You first begin to labor in the synagogue and imagine the chief ruler of the synagogue and his whole household gets saved. That'd be pretty exciting, wouldn't it? Look at chapter 18, verse 17. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat, and Gallio cared for none of these things. So the guy that replaces Crispus is a guy called Sosthenes. And Sosthenes, because they try to shut down the gospel campaign, he's taken by the magistrates, he's beaten, and all the rest of it, you know the story pretty well. But when you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, and it might just be a coincidence, but I, I think it's more than that. Notice it says, 1 Corinthians 1, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, so does that mean the first chief ruler of the synagogue got saved? And then the second chief ruler, like I guess people would be very reluctant to become the chief ruler of the synagogue because it means you're going to get saved. <laughs> Two of them saved. Tremendous, right? Amazing thing. So, so what we can say is that in the assembly in Corinth, there were, there were first of all, obviously some Jews... Uh, those that already abandoned paganism, had already gone to the synagogue, including the chief rulers, who were now part of the assembly in Corinth. Now look at, again with me at 1 Corinthians, because you want to see that obviously others were getting saved as well in the city of Corinth, who were not from that Jewish background. And so he says in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 2, Know ye not that you were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as you were led. And so it seems that as well as these religious sinners, like these rulers of the synagogue, there were also pagans that were getting saved, ones that were once carried away by to dumb idols, even as they were led. Uh, if, if you look at the um, passage we looked at in chapter 6, 1 Corinthians 6, Remember, we had this pretty horrendous list of things. Uh, and then Paul says, and such were some of you. And we, we want to just, we'll run down the, the list, list briefly here. But chapter 6, verse 9, he says, Know ye not, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, uh, and nor adulterers. And so we, we're talking about uh, sexual sin here. Uh, he says, uh, very clearly, uh, that in that assembly, uh, those that were fornicators, those that were idolaters, those that were adulterers, effeminate, abused themselves with mankind. So as we just think through them, so fornication, you know, sexual immorality, we, we, we'd expect that. In a city like Corinth, people were being saved out of a life that previously had been given over to sexual immorality of the widest imagination. You know, fornication and sexual immorality immorality in its widest aspect. So there were people from all kinds of backgrounds getting saved. And then idolaters, of course, it's an idolatrous city, the, the, the uh, Aphrodite and all the, that, and then adulterers. Now again, interesting that we talk about adultery as a sexual sin, 
but it's also a social sin, isn't it? I think we missed that point. It's a social sin because when, when it's adultery, you're talking about somebody that's married to somebody else. And usually, when you have sexual relations with somebody that's already married to somebody else, it doesn't help the marriage. Right? I mean, usually, it's, a, it's an unusual marriage that can survive adultery. Very unusual marriage. And so the, I'm thinking of the social implications. This is not just sex and morality. This, there's a social aspect to this. Lives are being affected. Children are being affected. The, the fabric of society is being undermined. And, and yet there were people in the assembly who used to live like that. Adulterers. And then, of course, you've got these, these effeminate people. And uh, the word literally means soft. It's used of soft clothing in Matthew 11, verse 8. And it usually refers to... Uh, male prostitutes um, of, um, who were you know, effeminate by their kind of ways and, and were often used and abused and, and of course the next one abuses themselves with mankind. Now, that would be the opposite end of it. That would be the person who's doing the abusing, uh, the male who uh, kind of takes the, you know, it's interesting even in homosexuality, um, they take the male and the female kind of role. Okay, so the first word is kind of the more female role. The second one is the more masculine role. And so again, it, all I'm saying is this. I wonder what the testimony meetings were like in the assembly in Corinth. Wouldn't you just love to hear them? I mean, this is the kind of people, because he says, such were some of you. People that used to live like this. That was their lifestyle. And, and it, it goes on and he talks about uh, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners, such were some of you. And here's, this is the point that I want us to get to tonight. And this is this, talk about sanctification. That when somebody gets well saved, the gospel itself has a life-changing effect upon them, doesn't it? The, the whole process of sanctification actually begins with the gospel, doesn't it? If anyone's in Christ, he is what? A new creature, new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. They used to be these kind of people. That's what they were, but they're not like that anymore. Such words. Isn't it wonderful? Such words, some of you. And don't you just love it? And, and, and he says, such were some of you. And, and then he says, but you were washed. Book of Revelation talks about the Lord Jesus, the one who washed us. In his own blood, doesn't it? Revelation 1 5. It, it, it talks about the washing of regeneration. Like God cleans them up. Isn't it amazing? These people, they've lived what we would consider to be vile lives, but maybe some of us once lived like that. But God cleans up people, He, he, he washes them. And we often say that, come now, let's reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And we talk about the, uh, you're washed in the blood, you know. And God is good at cleaning up filthy, dirty lives. And that's, that's the beginning of this life of holiness. It's the conversion experience itself. And when somebody gets well saved, these things happen. <clears throat> I have a, a friend, I, I did a, this is um, just last week, I was doing a men's intensive Bible study. Um, I was the only speaker, so I'm very relieved this week that uh, <laughs> I have two other speakers. And, and I, I actually, we went through 43 chapters of the book of Ezekiel. So you think this is going to be tough? This is a breeze compared to that. But what was interesting is that the guy who arranges that is a former drug dealer and drug user. And he arranges the men's intensive Bible study and loves it. That's the power of the gospel, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And so here we see, this is, this is what you used to be, and you were washed. And how wonderful it is to be washed. And then he says, not only were they washed, but you're sanctified. That's our word. That's what the word we're going to be thinking about. It means that God, they, they once lived this kind of life, but now God has set them apart for himself. They're 
And positionally, they're sanctified now. They're set apart for the Lord. And that sanctification is already having a practical effect because they're not what they used to be. But it's going to grow from there. But they're sanctified. And then he says, you're justified. Don't you just love that? All charges against them have gone. And now they're declared to be righteous. Because, because of what? Because of the power of the gospel that's the reason that's what's done this to these people it's the gospel and so it's thoroughly changed them and so as we consider this topic together over our time i want us to just kind of focus our minds on this whole idea of the impact of sanctification in the church you know when if our assemblies got active in the gospel again and started to see some of these kind of people saved and added to the assembly. You know what that would do to you? Yep. Nature. <laughs> it would get you pretty excited, wouldn't it? Amen. Yeah. And I found that when you have people that have just been saved out of the world and you talk about truth that we're we're so used to this stuff, we've heard it so many times, it's like you know, what's the big deal almost? I mean, it's sad to say, but we can get used to these things, can't we? And then you talk to some of these people, and they say, is that really true? Wow, that's amazing. And then you suddenly scratch your head and say, wow, it really is amazing. Yeah, I've forgotten how good this all is. <laughs> and that's why the gospel itself can have a tremendous sanctifying effect on our testimony. It really can so I want to encourage us tonight to think about this. How do we get from where we are to where we need to be? What changes do we need to make? How can we regain a vision like Paul, the apostle, had where he determined, <laughs> this is what I'm going to preach. This is my message. This is what I'm going to stick to. This is the, this is the need. This is what Corinth needs. Is this what Canada needs? Amen. It's certainly what we need down south of the border. It's the gospel is what's, it's not, you know, I, again, I appreciate, um, I appreciate the former president more and more every day that I live under the present administration. But Donald Trump is not the answer to America's problems. Jesus Christ, the gospel is. And it's the answer to all the problems. So if we don't get back to that, well, there's not much future. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for this first opening session. Lord, we, we pray for help, Lord. We need your help this week. We, we want to wrestle with these things. How did we drop the ball? How did we lose what was once, well, this whole movement had a fervor for the gospel. And uh, somehow it's just diminished. And we don't, want it, we don't want it to just end like this. We'd love to see you work again in all of us in that we would see the impact of the gospel in changing lives as it once did in our lives. Lord, we, we were in this list. This is how some of us lived. We're either we're in the religious sinner category or we're in the rotten sinner category, but we were sinners. And you changed us through the cross. And we want to see others changed by the cross. Help us, we pray, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Uh, don't worry. Uh...